Good morning. Welcome again to the Bethany Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church as we begin our time today with a reading of Charles Spurgeon's Morning and Evening. And as we go into this today, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you are the God of peace and the God of comfort. Dear God, you have called us not only to lives of holiness, but you have called us to lives where we sacrificially place you first in all that we do. And to God, we pray that we would see the wisdom of this. And dear God, that we would be honest, not only with our own disobedience, but dear God, for our need of your grace and of your sanctifying mercy. May you watch over us as we come and as we consider your many ways that we might grow in our appreciation for your power and for your glory. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning we are going to open up our morning reading with a look at Zechariah 14.7. At evening time, there shall be light. We often look forward with anxiety to the time of old age, forgetting that at evening time it shall be light. To many saints, old age is the choicest season in their lives. A warmer breeze fans the sailor's face as he nears the shore of immortality. Fewer waves ruffle his sea. Quiet reigns deep, still and solemn. From the altar of age, the flashes of the fire of youth are gone. But the deepening flame of sincere feeling remains. The pilgrims have reached the promised land, the happy country, whose days are as the days of heaven upon earth. Angels visit it, celestial gales blow over it, flowers of paradise grow in it, and the air is filled with heavenly music. Some live here for years, and others arrive only a few hours before their departure. But it is an Eden on earth. We may begin to long for the time when we can recline in its shady groves and be satisfied with hope until the time of fruition comes. The setting sun seems larger than when it is high in the sky, and a splendor of glory tinges all the clouds that surround its going down. Pain does not break the calm of the sweet twilight of age, for strength is made perfect in weakness, and endures it all patiently. Ripe fruits of choice experience are gathered as the rare food of life's evening, and the soul prepares itself for rest. The Lord's people will also enjoy light in the hour of death. Unbelief bemoans the evening shadows, the darkening night, the end of existence. But no, cries faith. The night is almost over and the true day is at hand. Light has come, the light of immortality, the light of the Father's countenance. Gather your feet up in the bed. See the waiting throng of angels ready to bear you away. Farewell, loved one. You are gone. You wave your hand. Now it is light. The pearly gates are open. The golden streets shine in the jasper light. We cover our eyes, but you behold the unseen. Adieu, dear friend, you have light at evening that we have not yet. Amen. What Spurgeon talks about in our morning devotion today can be read speaking of elderly saints who are elders of age. And there's a sense in which what he says here can be applied to them. But really, what Spurgeon is talking about here is the mature faith of those who are elders in righteousness, in holiness, and in understanding the blessings of the Lord. You know, one of the things uh, that uh, the Lord calls his covenant people to is to not be satisfied with milk, 
not be satisfied with uh, baby food, but to earnestly desire to eat the meat of God's holy word, to be able to digest the harder edges of Holy Scripture. And the purpose of this is, of course, not in order to lord that knowledge and that place above others, but to be humbled and reminded that knowing the grace of the Lord, understanding the depth of his work in Jesus Christ, is what gives us peace and comfort. Longing to be like our Savior is what true felicity looks like. Far too often we are satisfied with merely saying the words of repentance. We're satisfied uh, with admitting our sin, thinking that's all that the word requires. But Spurgeon here speaks of a greater place and a greater understanding where we long to move forward in repentance, embracing the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not being stuck in the miry mud of I'm sorry, but in the fruits of a life devoted to Jesus Christ. This again, is uh, what Spurgeon speaks of when he talks about the feeling of the light of the pearly gates and the golden streets and the jasper light. Knowing the fullness of God's grace is what grants us strength and perseverance in the face of the darkest days. Let's turn now to our evening reading today from 1 John 2, 1. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate. Yes, though we sin, we have him still. John does not say, if anyone sins, they have forfeited their advocate. But we have an advocate, even though we are sinners. All the sin that a believer ever did or can be allowed to commit cannot destroy his interest in the Lord Jesus Christ. The name given here to our Lord is suggestive. Jesus. He is the advocate that we need. For Jesus is the name of one whose business and delight it is to save. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. His sweetest name implies his success. Next, it is Jesus Christ, Christos, the anointed. This shows his authority to plead. Christ has a right to plead, for he is the Father's own appointed advocate an elected priest. If he were our choice, choice, he might fail. But if God has laid help on one who is mighty, we may safely place our trouble where God has laid his help. He is Christ and therefore authorized. He is Christ and therefore qualified. For the anointing has fitted him fully for his work. He can plead in such a way as to move the heart of God and prevail. What words of tenderness, what sentences of persuasion would the anointed use when he stands up to plead for me? One more aspect of his name remains, Jesus Christ, the righteous. This is not only his character, but his plea. It is his character, and if the righteous one is my advocate, then my cause is good, or he would not have represented it. It is his plea, for he meets the charge of unrighteousness against me by the plea that he is righteous. He declares himself my substitute and puts his obedience to my account. My soul, you have a friend perfectly fitted to be your advocate. He cannot but succeed. Leave yourself entirely 
in his hands. Amen. You know, we close with this reminder that all our hope is grounded in Jesus Christ. Our hope not only of eternal life, but of the goodness of this life is wrapped up in our union with him. When we come to him in faith, we have been spiritually united to him through the work of the Holy Spirit, through our being regenerated by that mighty call. And we as Christians must never forget nor forsake this great gift, this grant that has been given unto us by the Holy Father, that we bear not only the name which is above every name, but we have his righteousness. And in having this strength, when Satan attacks us, when the world entices us, what is our plea? That Jesus is the Christ the Son of the living God, our Savior, our Redeemer, and our Advocate. May the Lord bless you today, and may this be your strength as you face this moment. In Christ, amen.